Welcome to Physics Office Hours. My name is Eric. In this video, we're doing Bell's inequalities. That's right, if you're a local realist, you might wanna pay attention because everything you know and loved is about to be proven wrong, thanks to John Bell. In this video, we're gonna be following Townsend. Parts of the video, some of the blackboard might get caught off by the chat. I apologize, it should be legible, but if not, feel free to stop in my Discord and ask any questions. Either myself or any one of the other very talented people there can help you answer anything you'd like to know. My Discord and all my socials are down below. If you like physics content, I stream at twitch.tv slash physicsoh every Sunday, Wednesday, and Friday. Sunday from 1 to 4 p.m. and Wednesday and Friday from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. I'm always open to questions on any topic, so feel free to stop in and ask anything you'd like to know, and I'll do my best to answer. I hope you like this video. I will see you over on Twitch. And we're going to look at the same two particle pair. We're going to make a little bit different dis uh, description of of, um, of what we're actually looking at, but the math is going to show us that these two things just don't work. Uh, Einstein's and the quantum fuzziness that Brian Greene started with. So let's go to the board. I am going to shut this though. I missed something. How can you assign three possibilities to one particle? Three different axes of rotation. All right. So let's kind of lay out what Brian Greene was talking about with these particle pairs. And then we're going to see some more like the math and what's going on with the, uh, the intuition behind it and stuff. So we have two particles, right? And we can talk about their spin along an axis. Remember when we had the SG, the CERN Gerlach machine, we said that we could rearrange it however we wanted and we could call that the Z axis, right? So we could have particles come in here when we find out that some have spin up and some have spin down and we get these little spots on the detector that tell us which particles are spin up and spin down. And we noticed a couple weird things, like one of them was if you went to the first SGZ machine, you would get spin up, spin down, just like this, and you could block one part path off, and then you would just have spin up particles in the Z direction. You could send them to the SGX machine, which is basically a stern gerlach reoriented in a different axis. We'll call this one the X axis, and you'll get spin up, spin down. You can block that off send them back to a SGZ machine, and you expect to see only spin up SG, or spin up particles, because you've already blocked off the spin down particles in the Z axis. Instead, what we find is more spin up and spin down particles. Okay, so that's a little bit odd. Um, but yeah, so when you send the particle beam in, you will separate them in the SG axis, the SG in the Z axis, you will separate them to up and down. Then you can go to the SGX and separate them in the X axis to up and down. And when you go back to the Z axis, you again have up and down. So you can come up with a couple ways to, you know, to think like, oh, something, you know, weird's going on there. We can make it happen, blah, blah, blah. It's not that big of a deal, whatever, okay? We're gonna talk about this more specifically, but think of it the same way. Like you can pick an axis so this is spin up, spin down in the Z axis. But then here we go, it's spin up, spin down in the X axis, right? And then back to the Z axis and whatever you want to do it. Really just you take a measurement depending on the axis. So we can have a particle spinning up and a particle spinning down. So we'll call this particle one. This is particle two. It's going to be in some fuzzy mixture of spin up and spin down. And we can really make these axes whatever we want. They don't need to be um, a certain, uh, they don't need to be a certain, they don't need to be, you know, 90 degrees apart in different directions. We could just make the axes whatever we want. And what Brian Greer is talking about is having axes where you have one going here, one going here, and one going here on a two-dimensional plane where all three of these angles are 120 degrees, right? Like, that's perfectly fine. We can measure the spin of particle one and two along this axis, along this axis, or along this axis. It doesn't matter. Okay? Well, actually, we'll call this, instead of one, two, three, let's be, let's call this A, B, and C. So, what are the possibilities that we're going to get if we measure these particles along each axis? 
So let's see here. If we take one group of particles, we'll call them N1, uh, we'll have a group that looks like this, where the first particle is going to have, we can say this, we'll have spin up on every axis. So A, B, and C for particle 1 will be spin up, up, up. Okay, so for particle 2, we'll have for the axes, then there, so therefore the axes have to be down, down, down. Because if you measure 1 in A, then when you measure 2 in A, it's got to be opposite. Okay? That's the whole entanglement side of things. But that doesn't necessarily have to be true if you measure different axes. So let's consider some group of particles. We're going to do this with a ton of, a, a large amount of particles. So we're going to say that this is the amount of particles that have this spin. This is, again, Einstein's viewpoint. This is the viewpoint where these particles are this spin. They have these spin for each direction. And there is nothing spooky about this. Instead, this makes perfect sense, if you think about it. Like the way that the, when the particle is created, it's created with this spin. And each of these, uh, each time it hits a detector, you're just revealing what spin it's had since the time that it was created. So these are all the possible combinations of what we might expect to find if we start taking measurements, right? So let's do a little probability game, okay? <clears throat> Suppose we want to look at the set N2. More or less, we want the set of N2, and we want all of the possibilities of having opposite signs. So what are the possibilities of having opposite signs? Well, what are the possibilities in general? We're also going to take account that we're not going to be doing A, A, B, B, and C, C. Okay? So what are the two, what are the six arrangements? Well, let's see. We have N, B. I'm sorry, A, B. We have... BA, we have AC, we have CA, we have BC, and CB. Those are the six options of measuring particles not in the same, not on the same axes. Okay? So which one of those is going to give us opposite spins? So let's look at N2. This is what we're talking about, N2. Uh, so let's see, if we do A, B, we have A and B. So that one's good. So obviously B, A is going to be good. How about A, C? A, C, nah. So therefore C, A is also nah. And then B, C. That and that. Oh, I'm sorry. Haha. -ha. B and C. Excuse me. So that's no. And then therefore C and B is no too. So that one no, and that one no. So really, we only get one, right? So what's the probability that we're going to find particles with uh, opposite spins? Well, if we're measuring, if we're not measuring on A, A, B, B, or C, C, then we're going to get uh, two out of six, or one third. So the probability that we'll measure particle one. Uh, you know, up and particle two down. Let's see, how do we want to do this? Yeah, particle one and particle two in N2. Is, I'm not going to write the probabilities yet. That's going to get too complicated. But you guys get the picture. The probability, if we're measuring this sample of particles, the probability that we'll get it is one third. This is true for N2 through N7. If we apply all of these, this is all true. Each of these, there's a probability of getting opposite signs of one third. With 1 and 8, you're going to get opposite signs for everything. So it's going to be uh, a little bit different. Um, <clears throat> all right. Which will be 100% be probability that you're going to get opposites, or you'll get opposite signs for a measurement. Okay? And that's what, Einstein, that's what Einstein's idea is. Okay? So let's see. Hi, Quinn. How are you? Order matters or uh, permutation or accommodation? No. Oh, I didn't even read that. Thank you, Jax. I did not read that. <laughs> didn't see what it was. 
but I'm sure it wasn't good. Thank you, Jax. Um, all right, let's see, what else do we got? All right, so this is where we're at with that. Uh, if you measure any one of these groups of particles, you'll find you'll get a one-third chance of spin up, spin down. Now, let's take a look at what quantum mechanics tells us. Okay, we're gonna leave this up because we're gonna come back to it. What does quantum mechanic tell us? Well, we can talk about any type of, of measurement along an axis, we'll call it n. So we're just gonna have some plus n axis is gonna equal cosine theta over two plus c plus e to the i phi, doesn't matter so much, sine theta over two of minus z. Okay, now these are your states, your spin states. Uh, you might need to have a little bit of an understanding of what spin states are before we, you know, when you're talking about this, but if you can imagine, plus c is just gonna be spin up on the z axis and minus is just gonna be spin down on the x axis. Some people might write it like this. Uh, but it's just on what axis, we're choosing z, okay? And again, it doesn't really matter. We can talk about any n axis and it's not gonna be a big deal. If we want to talk about what the difference is between, you know, a plus z and the inner product of plus z and n, right? Like what is the z axis and uh, what is the z if we want to go on the n basis? And we can find out that it's just going to be cosine of theta over 2. And then n can be anything. Theta could be, you know, theta is, you know, from, is a made, the angle between, you know, n and and z. Okay? Doesn't matter what it is, it's just theta. And we did this when we did the x, when we did the x, you know, when we oriented our, our, our Stern-Gerlach on the x-axis and the z-axis. Alright, so let's do something like this. What if we wanted to measure, uh, did I not write it down? Oh, I did write it down, sorry. We can take the state, 0, 0, which is like the true ground state, okay? It's a, the ground state singlet for a spin, for two, a pair of spin particles. And we can write it in the A basis, right? So we'll have plus A minus A minus 1 over root 2. Actually, I gotta give myself more room. Minus 1 over root 2 of minus A plus a. Now everybody who's seen quantum mechanics one has seen this. This is the singlet and the a basis. It basically just means we're writing the up and down as a superposition of, you know, up and down for spin for particle one and particle two, you know, particle one, particle two. And this is, you know, the ground state, the true ground state or whatnot. So then we can see what, well, how do we get the probability between measuring, let's say minus a and plus b and what we'll do is we'll take the inner product with the ground state, okay? And we'll get the following. We'll get one half, or I'm sorry, one, uh, one over the square root of two times the minus a plus b inner product of plus a minus a uh, minus one over root two times the inner product of minus a plus b and minus a plus a. Now minus a and plus a, uh, the inner product of those is going to be zero because they are perpendicular or anti-parallel, excuse me, sorry, what? It's just going to be zero. And uh, sorry for the fumble over words. Uh, but the other state is not, this is going to be one and we're going to get the following. Uh, we'll get one over the square root of two times some state plus b plus a. We don't know of the, excuse me, plus a, my chalk is a little tiny. We don't know the angle between b and a, so we can't say any statements about perpendicular. So, but we can say that we know how to write it, right? We have this. So that means we can write this the following way. The probability of measuring this, or I should say the amplitude, the probability amplitude, is going to be one over root two times the cosine of theta AB divided by two. 
So that means if we wanted to find the probability of plus a, well, let's write it like this first because we're going to need that notation later. a plus b, 0, 0 is equal to 1 half cosine squared theta a b over 2. Well, the reason for it being is we found what it is if it's, this is, a, remember that this is supposed to be, this is the same thing, where is it, right here, as saying, you know, down and up. We're trying to find what the probability is of finding down and up. Because before we found it to be one third using Einstein's classical method. So let's see about finding, so this is the, pro, we'll leave this up, this is the probability of finding the first half of it, now let's find the second half of it which is, we'll do it a lot faster because we've already done it once, and we know that this is going to be, uh, we'll call this equation 1, this is going to be from down below, minus a plus b, 0, 0, squared is equal to 1 half cosine squared theta a b over 2. Now we can do the other one, we'll call this equation 2, and we have a plus b, oh sorry, this is plus a minus b, excuse me. And that's going to be, again, the inner product with the ground state for the probability is going to be 1 half cosine squared theta a b over 2. Now, we can look at what it is if we have these angles of 120 in between with a, b, and c. And what do we find? Well, 1 plus 2 is going to give us cosine squared a b over 2 which is equal to 1 fourth which is not <laughs> 1 third so therefore we have realized that uh, uh, therefore we the, the, the per, sorry by the way uh, neural vibe the, the permutations only matter with the signs if these are spin half then we're, they just have to switch the signs but it shouldn't matter overall all the probabilities and stuff you do complex conjugates uh, squared, so it's not gonna. The signs of the orders don't matter, um, but yeah, you can basically think of this like permutations. Um, so at the angle, if theta is equal to one twenty, then we get one fourth, which is not equal to one third. So one of them has to be right, right? We found if you use the traditional way of just counting up the possibilities, you're gonna get one third. If you use the ways of finding it using quantum mechanics and figuring out the same thing that we found in stern gerlach we found that you get a different value for these problems. So how do we do it? Well, let's talk about the inequalities. Let's talk about these inequalities. One can imagine writing in the following equations down, okay? I don't know why I keep erasing that and then keep needing it again. If we go back to Einstein's, Einstein's way, right? We have n3 plus n4. This is going to be the sum of all of the um, particles in n3 plus the particles in n4. Remember, this is Einstein way again. So we can just write, you know, we're going to add the particles of 2 to the particles of 4. This is going to be less than or equal to. And then we'll also add the particles in 3 to the particles in 7. Now clearly this side is going to be less than or equal to this because here's 3 and 4 and we're just adding stuff to it. This is the root of the uh, equality. It's good to have two different angles to view lectures from. It helps me see the ideas from different points of view. Yeah, I kind of like that as well. And I like the, uh, I really like the, to go into like the actual math of it as opposed to just see like the animations. The animations are nice, but it's fun to, it's fun to actually get into it. Uh, Okay, so we can go over, and we can talk about the classical probabilities again, but this time we're going to be more inclusive of a larger sample size. And we'll say that the probability for n3 plus n4 is just going to be, you know, the amount of these over the sum of all of the particles. And what do we get? Well, we get some probability up for a and up for b. Okay, why? Well, let's look at 3 and 4. Uh, we have up for A and up for B, 
and four we have up for A and up for B. Okay, so that's good. So we get probabilities for up for A and up for B. Remember, this is particle one and particle two. Okay. All right. Next up, what if we have N2 plus N4? This is for the other side. All over the sum of I and I. And this is going to be the probability of A up and C up, right? Particle 1, particle 2, N2 and N4, those are the groups, right? Uh, we have A is up and we have C is up. Uh, for 4, A is up and C is up. Okay, so that's good. We have that. So that's the probability using Einstein's thing, you know, that gives us the probability. Lastly, we have N3 plus N7. And... Uh, Again, we're looking for ups. I think, what is this? I. Right. And this gives us the probability of C being up and B being up. Okay? So again, if you want to see it, 3, C is up, B is up, 7, C is up, B is up. So now we can rewrite Bell's inequality by just rewriting this in terms of the equalities, right? Because this is just going to be like dividing everything by the sum of, you know, all of the particles. That's fine. We can divide both sides by that. That's not going to hurt anything. And we can rewrite Bell's inequality the following way. I really want to leave this side up, which is why I keep erasing everything. <clears throat> and Bell's inequality is P a, B is less than or equal to P, A, C plus P, C, excuse me. And this is the, pro if you've taken quantum one, you've probably seen Bell's inequality in one shape, way, shape, or form. This is coming directly from, uh, from Townsend. So, uh, Let's see here. Take all of these measurements to find the following. All right, so what we're going to do is now we're going to go ahead and we're going to figure out what this, the, uh, what this would be using quantum mechanics, OK? Probably amplitude for finding this, we're going to do the same thing, except now we have up and up. Before I showed you what it was up and down by using N2 and N N6, I think I misunderstood boring math professor, but we'll get there when we get there. <laughs> 1 over root 2 um, plus B minus A. So what do we get when we do this? Well, we get something very similar to the last thing. Uh, and what does that mean? Well, this is going to be 1 over root 2 of the sine theta a b over 2. So again, using that same formula that we started with, you can go ahead and crunch all the numbers and you'll find this. So that means we can find the probability. I need to get better chalk. Yeah, look. Probability of a and b is going to be given by 1 half sine squared theta a b over 2 right and this is very similar to the thing we found before the only difference being before we were doing down up and now we're doing up up okay not a big deal just different and uh, the only thing that changed looks like a trig function so again no biggie we can do the same thing for all of these and we'll get the following inequality we can just recast this inequality using what we learned from here we'll get sine squared theta a b over 2 is less than or equal to sine squared theta, what's it, a c? a c over 2 plus sine squared c b over 2. Now, let's recast again the angle, and let's say, let's just do, instead of doing this triangle or this, this set of axes, Let's do a different one. Let's do A here and B here. We'll, and then C is directly in the middle. Okay? 
So this is A, C, and B. Again, the axes don't really matter. They're kind of trivial. We can handle them because we're doing things that where we're using that original equation. We're using the end state, you know? So when we use the end state, the differences between the axes don't matter that much. It's just a matter of, of knowing what the angle is. So we'll say this total angle is 60, this is 30, and we're going to use this weird thing that looks like this, which is equal to 30 degrees. Oh, I'm sorry. This is equal to 60 degrees. Or pi over 3. <clears throat> How did I write that? Oh, yeah, let's do it. Let's do I'm sorry. Let's do it. Let me stick to my notes. This is equal to 30 degrees. Excuse me. Which is equal to pi over 6. Get it straight. Okay. What does that mean? Well, that means we can recast this like this. Sine squared of this new, weird, cool looking like theta. I think it's just capital or something like that. Um, now, if this is a bisector, like if each of these, you know, are 30, then that makes these two things identical, which means now we can write this like this, 2 times sine squared of the fancy looking theta divided by 2. Now, if you plug in fancy theta equals 30, you'll get the following. On this side of the equation, you'll get 3 fourths. And on this side, less than or equal to 1 half. This is obviously not true. 3 fourths cannot be less than or equal to 1 half. That makes no sense. I hope you realize that this makes no sense. It don't make no sense. No sense. So what do we do? But we have done two different ways to show that if you talk about probabilities of spin up, spin down, if you're measuring a set of particles, they're not the same. If you talk about the inequalities of the two, we followed this inequality very straightforward. We came up with this inequality, very straightforward. Then we came up with this inequality, also very straightforward. But when you do it quantum mechanically, this doesn't make sense. So one of them's got to give. It turns out. When tested with experiment, my bottom corner is hidden. Oh, you're right. Let's see here. Boop. Boop. So that's what we're looking at. Oh, now I put my chair in the way. Oh, now I put my head in the way. There we go. So now you guys can see everything. It looks so weird. It's three-fourths is less than one-half, which is just obviously so many ways wrong. But we can actually do this experiment. We can actually measure it. Bell came up with the brilliant idea on how to measure it. <laughs> um, when we figured out how to measure it, what did we find? Well, we actually found... Oh, I'm on the wrong page. I want to make sure I get it right. We found that the uh, spin of the particle, or the, uh, where is it? The idea that we, of Einstein's, where it should be, you know, uh, the one-third and the three-fourths and all the other jazz, but the, 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 the viewpoint of Einstein was wrong by nine standard deviations. Which remember how I said like five standard deviations is like good, like we're in the we're in the if you get under five standard deviations then you're pretty good, like that's experimental findings worth like looking at. But this was wrong by nine standard deviations. That's hugely wrong. <laughs> 